Hi folks, this is Jay. Hope you're okay today. We're looking at the origin of the four gospels by Constantine Con uh, Constantin von Tischendorf. Now I don't agree uh, everything with Tischendorf. Uh, he's a very very famous scholar of the nineteenth century who which I'll tell you a little bit about him uh, about his life. He was uh, born in January 18, 1915, uh, died December 7, 1874. He was a noted German biblical scholar. Uh, this is from uh, Wikipedia, but I'm just reading a little bit of this, um, just so you get the facts. Um, he deciphered Codex uh, Ephremi uh, Rescriptus, a 5th century Greek manuscript, of the New Testament uh, in 1840, he rediscovered the Codex Sinaiticus, a 4th century New Testament manuscript. So that's just a little bit about him. And if you go on Wikipedia, you'll find massive uh, information that's very helpful. Uh, you get a, a list of his books, um, and uh, there's links to his various writings, um, some articles about him. Now, the thing about Tischendorf is I don't fully agree with a guy. I don't agree with the uh, new breed of textual critics that came from Tischendorf um, on textual criticism. I'm more in the uh, Dean Bergen school. However, the work that we're going to look at, uh, recent scholarship over the last 20 years in the Gospels, um, is showing that the scholars like Rudolf Bultmann and people like that, um, great weaknesses in that kind of scholarship. And there's been a renewal and a rediscovery of that there's eyewitness material in the Gospels, that the Gospels were a lot written a lot earlier than supposedly people thought. And so there's been a massive... Uh, a renaissance uh, in turning the clock back from what skeptics were thinking into more of an orthodox position. I'm not saying that everybody agrees. Uh, it's noted by some uh, scholars that there'd be a backlash to this kind of conservative way of looking at things. So there will be and is a backlash to it. But the reason why I'm reading from Tischendorf is a lot of the arguments being thrown about today. Um, can be answered even by all the new research that's been found with manuscripts and um, all the various literature that's been found. Um, we can we can uh, we can uh, go back to Tischendorf and find arguments that are very helpful uh, for today in the academic world because it's basically going back to things that we already knew and looking at them in a fresh a fresh way. So for example, um, going back to Irenaeus and, and various ancient texts like that, and I'm reinterpreting them. So anyway, let's get to Tischendorf, and his book uses the classical arguments in the defense of the origin of the Gospels, which I think need to be heard today. He says on page 23, the life of Jesus has become center of religious controversies which agitate our age. The importance of this fact is great. At its foundation lies the confession that Christianity is not grounded so much on the doctrine of him from whom it received its name as upon his person. Every accepitation of the word Christianity which is antagonistic to this confession disowns the real character of the term and rests on misconception. The person of Jesus is the cornerstone of which the church bases its foundation. To it, the doctrine of Jesus and, um, and of his disciples always and with the utmost distinct, distinctness points with the person of Jesus. Christianity stands or falls. To rob this person of his greatness, of that greatness which the entire church ascribed to him under the name Son of God, and yet to think to retain the Christian faith and the Christian church is a futile attempt, vain mockery. Even the morality which some might hope to rescue from the general shipwreck of faith is weakened by the unavoidable and remorseless contradictions which arise. For if the morality is sound, it must be a good tree growing from a diseased root. The life of Jesus is the most 
momentous of all questions which the church has to encounter, the one which is decisive whether it shall or shall not live. Whence do we derive our knowledge of the life of Jesus almost exclusively from our four Gospels, in which the divine person of Jesus, the centre of Christian belief, and the main object of all attacks upon it is presented in essentially the same light as in the Epistle of Paul? Unquestionably, the oldest of all the apostolic documents, all else that we know of him, is confirmed to a few expressions and acts, and the unimportant exceptions is in the direct connection with and dependent on the Gospels. By far the most of these sources are to be found in the apocryphal, i.e. not genuine, untrustworthy fragments, not bearing the true names of their authors and aiming the more or less skill to supplement and complement the Gospel narratives. Others, partly of Jewish and partly of Ethan origin, avow that very outset the intention of Hussein and the Gospels. Finally, we possess the two classical writers of the first and the two following centuries, Tacitus and Pliny, a few incidental expressions which have a lasting interest, the first testifying that Christ, the founder of the religion, which again so strong a hold even in Nero's time, had been punished with death by the procurator Pontius Pilate, and during the reign of Tiberius, while Pliny asserts in a communication to Trajan that the Christians already, a numerous body, body in Bithynia, were in the habit of singing songs of praise to Christ as to a God. Our Gospels, therefore, if not the only authorities relative to the life of Jesus, are by all by all odds the most important ones, and the only direct sources that are in existence. If then the life life of Jesus is only made to us by the Gospels. If we are directed to these books for the solution of all our questions about the birth, the activities, the conversation, character and fortunes of Jesus, we have, of course, no less weighty in inquiry before us than this, when spring our Gospels. For upon the origin of these books hinge their trustworthiness and all their value. So much depending on this first step, very many are the investigations which have been made in these modern times into the origin of the Gospels. It has been a question with what justice the names of the prominent members of the Twelve, Matthew and John, and the names of the helpers and followers Mark and Luke have been assigned to the four Gospels. Just so far as the authorship of these documents has been admitted, as due to those revered, revered men, the Gospels have been accepted as authentic and trustworthy record of the life of the Lord. Their names have been regarded as satisfactory guarantee, guarantee that in the writing in which they were coupled truth could only be sought, that in them truth only was wished, and that in them truth uh, was authentically recorded. There is indeed another way of testing the reliability of the Gospels. After the rise of rationalizing a rationalistic spirit, and then when the attempt was made to set the reason of man above everything which had previously borne the name of divine revelation, hands were laid at once on the biblical miracles, and it was claimed that they must be explained by the light of the imperfect culture of that time, and the incorrect appreciation of the Old Testament. Out of this grew the theory of accommodation, as it was called, which asserted that Jesus made his words chime in with the expectation of his age and that he gave himself out to be a more important personage than he really was. This theory of the rise of the Gospels has culminated in the piece of botch work which issued from the Paris Press in 1863. The author of that book, not troubling with any speculations respect to the share with which the apostles may have had in delineated the Gospel portraits, but following his own self-imposed theories about miracles and revelations, has displayed boundless recklessness and given way to the most unbridled fantasies respect to the gospel history, catering both the, uh, caricaturing both it and its hero. He has written a book which has much more the character of a shameless colony of Jesus than of an honest investigation into his career. Can we apply the terms historical inquiry to an attempt to show that John wrote the fourth gospel out of a spirit of self-love, not without jealousy of Peter and full of hatred to Judas Iscariot, can we dignify by so high a term as scientific investigation such a theory as this respect to the cause of sympathy felt for Jesus by the wife of Pilate that she saw the Gentile Galilean, the fine-looking young man from a window of the palace that looted out in the temple court, and that in consequence the thought that the blood was to be spilled rested like a mountain lord upon her soul? To cite one or two more examples of this mode of dealing with the Gospels, 
what shall we say of his manner of treating raising of Lazarus where he endeavours uh, to show that Jesus whose role was becoming more and more difficult every day practiced an involuntary piece of deception in uh, end of quote uh, end uh, a bit there what, what I want to say here what Tischendorf is doing is he's just taking on various scholars of his time but what what is very interesting um, which modern scholars today often don't tell you is the evangelical scholars of the 19th century uh, were dealing with these textual critical issues in a very scientific way trying to do it in an objective way and what is not often remembered or noted is the more esoteric uh, creative scholarship the the Strausses, the Rainers, were people who did not base the scholarship on as a scientific foundation as people like Tischendorf and so Tischendorf is absolutely demolishing his opponents by sticking to good uh, methodology uh, trying to keep us objective to the evidence of the facts rather than presenting uh, theories uh, that are creative but not, a based, not based in any reality of fact and that's what you see uh, from the 19th century almost to the 20th century. Modern textual critics and modern uh, New Testament scholars come into the subject with creative theories that have very little, little evidence and the ignoring of a vast weight of evidence. And no matter how objective you come, it was impossible to break this noose that these kind of scholars have got. However, things are changing today in the academic World. But the point is this, that people like Tischendorf and Bishop Lightfoot and many others had to fight too for now to try and be sober scholars and critique uh, the more popular scholarship that was trying to win over the uh, people's thinking but was not actually based in any decent scholarship whatsoever. And we have to blame the German scholars for that, for being too esoteric. And so we're going to jump a few pages now because he goes into Rainan and he goes into a few other scholars. And we'll get into uh, some of the meat. It seems to me, he says, that this duty has been by no means faithfully enough met for the first three so-called synoptic gospels, and still less for that of John, who want of authenticity has been inscribed in flaming letters upon the banners of the negative school. The writer of these lines imposes upon himself the task of trying to throw some light upon the evangelical documents. Although in preparing the work, not as special students, but cultivated Christians generally, it may not be possible to enter so exhaustively into the subject uh, as under the circumstances might be desirable. We can make as our starting point the unquestioned fact that in the last decade of the second century our four gospels were known and acknowledged in all portions of the church. Here we get into some meat now. Irenaeus from 177 on, Bishop of Lyons where the first Christian church of Gaul was established, wrote a great work in the last decade of the second century, directed the early heresies, the Gnostic, and on every page made use of the Gospels. Now this fact, this is me now, not touching on, this fact, this fact alone is absolutely devastating to people like Bart Ehrman and modern textual critics and modern uh, conspiracy theories about the New Testament. End of quote. That, that was just, let's get back to Tishendor. Um, Aaron S. on every page made use of the Gospel, providing himself from from them with material to overthrow a system which was threatening to destroy the doctrines of the church. The number of passages where he has recourse to the Gospels is about 400 and about 80 of these contain quotations from the Gospel of John. I mean to me, this is me again, to me this is absolutely devastating to any critic of the New Testament because what it tells you is the four Gospels were early historical material when you compare this historical material to say the life of Caesar or to the life of Cleopatra or whatever this is astounding because it's telling you that these sources uh, go back early on now one uh, perceptive atheist what, said what do you mean by early well early can mean uh, within 50 years of the event it can mean 100 years of the event whether it be 50 years or 100 it's still compared in the ancient 
history and ancient literature is vastly superior to to any ancient literature when it comes to historical information. Uh, he says, from the closing decades of the second century on, the able and learned Tertullian lived and labored at Carthage in Africa, and in his numerous, numerous writings there exist hundreds of citations from the text of the Gospels. Again, this is me, devastating to bar ermine and modern scholars today who would attack the veracity of the New Testament, which, back to Tishendorf, which he made use of as his most dis decisive authorities. The same is true of Clemens and the celebrated teacher in the school of the catacombs at Alexandria about the end of the second century. Nor must I fail to allude to a catalogue generally known by the name of its discoverer, the in scholar Maratori, of all the books which were regarded as canonical in the very earliest times. This work was probably prepared at Rome and shortly after the time of the Roman Bishop Pius II, some were between 160 to 170 AD. In this catalogue of books thus reckoned as comprising the New Testament, the four Gospels are at the head. It is true the first few lines which relate to Matthew and Mark have been lost, but at the close of the still extant words respecting the later, the Gospel of Luke is spoken of as the third and that of John as the fourth, enabling us to see that even in the very earliest days the order was followed with which we are so familiar. I have thus summoned the witness from Gaul, from Proconsular Africa, the present Algiers, from Alexander and from Rome. Two others can be cited for fitly here, although one of them goes back to the re remote date. End, end of Tischendorf, I'll carry on in a minute. Here's an important point that the textual critics, Bart Ehrman and many, many scholars fail to see, and the critics. Notice that Tischendorf is showing that we have a bishop from Gaul, a leader from Africa, a leader from Alexandria, and from Rome. Different parts of the ancient world believing in the uh, the uh, Gospels as written by uh, the writers who wrote them. That is a highly significant fact. What that tells you, if that's happening in the second century, what that clearly tells you, and skeptics do not fathom this out, and you need to understand that if the Gospel has spread in the second century so wide, and was so well known in the second century, it clearly shows you that these are going back to the first century and not only going back to the first century but they are intricately connected to the, the uh, historical here's a quote Here, here's a very important point the historical oral tradition of um, the Gospels now notice I didn't say oral tradition I said historical tradition very important distinction there uh, James Dunn has, has made that distinction and it's a very important distinction because in the ancient church in the gospel writers of the gospels there were two types of oral tradition uh, just a parenthesis uh, oral tradition you have to look at it in its cultural it's culturally specific that's another issue that a lot of skeptics fail to realize each culture has a different aspect a different way of passing on its oral traditions and so they are culturally specific and within uh, the time of the Gospels, there were two types of oral tradition. The one where you passed it on by mouth, and what we would call historical oral tradition. That is, individual people who were seen as important in collecting the, the historical information of the past and passing it on, either by writing or by verbal uh, passing it on. Uh, so what it, what the whole point is that what Tischendorf has noted here, which is very important, is that the Gospels were already well known in the second century uh, in Gaul, Africa, Alexandria and Rome, which tells you they, they are first century documents, which tells you that they have been carefully preserved with coming from historical oral tradition. Okay, let's get back to Tischendorf. Uh, if you if you want to for more information on that, go and listen to James Dunn's lectures on oral tradition. So, Tischendorf says two others can be cited fitly here, although one of them goes back to uh, remoter date. I mean the two oldest translations of the Greek text used by the apostles themselves. One of these is the Syriac version and bears the name of Pishato, and the other is the Latin version known under the title Itala 
Both of them give the four Gospels their fill place. The canonical acceptance of all four must unquestionably be in general as we see that they were transferred openly and as a whole in the language of the newly converted Christians, the Latinus and Syrians. The Syri Syriac translation, which takes us to the neighborhood of the Euphrates, is almost universally assigned to the end of the second century. And although positive proofs are wanting in support of this date, yet we are not without good grounds for accepting it. The Latin version, on the contrary, had begun to gain general recognition even before the end of the second century. For both Tertullian in his quotations from Irenaeus and the Latin translator of Irenaeus' great word against heresy, writing about the end of the second century, make use of the text of the Itala. This, of course, implies that Latin translation was made some years before the close of the second century. I shall have a case subsequently to allude again to the striking fact that it was necessary to translate the Gospels into Latin and Syriac as early as the second half of the second century, and that the number of documents was limited to the four with which we are now familiar. Looking a little more closely into the testimony of the two great fathers, Irenaeus and Tertullian, we have to ask, can their evidence be so limited in its application as only to prove that the four Gospels were fully accepted in their day? Irenaeus not merely invests these documents with entire authority in the citations which he makes to overthrow the Gnostic heretics. It even appears in his work that the Gospels, or rather to use his own expression, the fourfoldness of the Gospel has been conformed to the analogy of the four quarters of the globe, the four chief winds, the four faces of the cherubim. He asserts that the four Gospels are the four pillars on which the church rests as it covers the whole earth and in the number of four recognized a special token of the creator's wisdom. In such a representation, is such a representation compatible with the facts, facts that at the time of Irenaeus the four gospels first began to be accepted, or that an attempt was then being made to append a fourth and newer one to the three older ones then current? Is it not much more credible that the acceptance of all the four was then of so long standing and so thoroughly complete that the Bishop of Lyons could allude to the fourfoldness of the Gospel as a thing universally recognized, and in consequence of this very recognition, speak of it as a thing which harmonizes with great and unchanging uh, cosmical relations. Irenaeus died in the second year after the close of the second century, but in his youth he had sat at the feet of the venerable Polycarp, who had been a disciple of John the Evangelist, and have been acquainted with many eyewitnesses of Jesus' life. In mentioning this fact, Irenaeus alludes, alludes very tenderly to the statement of his teacher Polycarp, that all that he had heard from the lips of John and other disciples of Jesus coincided fully with the written account. Yet let us hear his own words, and give that, given in a letter to Florinus, I saw you while I was yet a youth in Lower Asia with Polycarp, when you were li living in the scenes of princely splendor, and when you were striving to gain the approval of Polycarp, what took place then is fresher in my memory than what has occurred more recently. What we took in our youth grows up as it were with us, and is incorporated in us, and as such even now bring back to mind just the place where the good Polycarp used to sit. When he talked to us, how he looked as he came in and as he went out, and how as he lived, how he used to speak to the people, how he used to allude to his intercourse with John and repeat, the words of the others who had seen the Lord, or how he used to recount what he had heard from their own lips about the miracles and the teachings of the Lord, and all in full accord with the written narrative. Thus writes Irenaeus respecting his intercourse with Polycarp and respecting the communication of Polycarp, the date of the young Irenaeus intercourse with the agreed saint must be set approximately at about the year 150 AD. Irenaeus died in 202, A.D. according to all accounts, a martyr while Polycarp perished at the stake in 165 A.D. after having, quote, to use his own expression, quote, served the Lord 86 years, end of quote. Has it to be believed that Irenaeus never heard from his teacher whose communications respecting John he expressively refers to? One word regarding the Gospel of John? Indisputably, one part of Polycarp's testimony relative to John's Gospel carries us back to John himself. Just having a little rest here for a second. But Polycarp's evidence respecting the work of his teacher must be based upon the testimony of his teacher. The case becomes all the more clear the more closely we look into 
into it on the adversary side and range ourselves with those who deny the validity of John's gospel. According to this view, Polycarp, although saying so much to Irenaeus regarding John, did not drop a word regarding the gospel of John. But supposing he did not, is it credible that Irenaeus fully accepted that gospel, that work which seemed to be the noblest gift of John to Christianity? The report of an eyewitness respected the life, death and resurrection of the Saviour of the world as a gospel which ran, diff, uh, ran directly counter the testimony of the three other evangelists, would not the very circumstances that Polycarp made no mention of it have convinced Irenaeus of its want of authenticity? And yet it is asserted that in order to meet and overflow, overthrow false teachers and the man who falsified the canon, he did not hesitate to reckon the Gospel of John strictly embracing among the sacred books. This on which I am now laying stress is nothing new. It has long stood recorded on those pages of Irenaeus. It has long been read there, but it has not had its due weight. Else how could it have been so lightly passed over? For my own part, I must completely justify the assigning of much greater weight on the part of correct and thorough investigators to the testimony of Polycarp and Irenaeus respect to the Gospel of John than to all the difficulties and all the objections urged by skeptical scholars. And is the case not similar with Tertullian and his testimony respect to the Gospel? This man who had been transformed from a worldly heathen lawyer into a powerful advocate of divine truth enters so critically into the question of the origin and relative value of the four Gospels is expressly to subordinate Mark, Luke, to Matthew and John on the ground that the former were mere helpers and companions of the apostles, while the later were selected by the Lord himself and investigated with full, invested with full authority. The same author propounds also an inexpungible canon of historical criticism, a test of truth of the early Christian documents and especially those of apostolic origin, in that he makes the value of testimony dependent on the epoch of the witness and demands that what was held as true in his day should be judged in the light of its prior acceptance. If it has been accepted before, it was fair to suppose that it had been equally accepted in the time of the apostles. Its authenticity must therefore have been admitted by the apostle church, apostolical church, founded as it was by the apostles themselves. And is it to be believed that this acute man was capable of being deceived in his acceptance of the Gospels and in his defense of them by anything, anything web of sophistry or touch of charlatanism? The passages just referred to are taken from his celebrated reply to Martian, who in wanton and heretical spirit had impunged the authenticity of the Gospels. Three of the four he had only excluded, and of the four he retained only just so much as it pleased him to do. In reply to him, Tertullian expressly bases his argument on the ground that at the time when the Apostolic Church was founded, all the four Gospels were accredited. As such a statement no weight in the mouth of a man like Tertullian, when he wrote scarcely a hundred years had elapsed since the death of John, and that date the testimony appealed to, to by him of the church at Ephesus in which John had laboured so long and amid which had died must have been full and decisive respecting the genuineness or spiriness of John's gospel? Nor was it a matter of any difficulty to ascertain what was the judgment with this church passed on the gospel. And we must not overlook the fact that we have not to do in this matter with a scholar who is contending himself with merely learned investigations, but with a man full of earnestness respecting his faith and taking very seriously the question of human salvation. The Christian documents which asserted a connection between themselves and the origin of the new faith, the documents which all the worldly wisdom of the time in which Tertullian himself was reared took offence, were they likely to be accepted by him without inquiry and in a blind credulity? And inasmuch as he expressly assures us that he bases his acceptation of all the four Gospels on the credit of the Apostolic Church, is it not unworthy suspicion the doubting that he made through inquiry into the capacity of the apostolic church to pass on an authentic judgment on the Christian doc documents? End of quote. I'll just reflect on what he said here and tell you my thoughts about this. Basically what he's saying, um, you've got all these esoteric modern scholars of his day saying that we've got to get under the Gospels, 
uh, what the church is telling us is not true. The gospels are of later antiquity, the a later date. They're not actually uh, decent historical source material. They don't go to the first century. They're probably all second century documents. These are the kind of ideas that were being spouted at the time of Tischendorf. What Tischendorf does is just go to the historical documents. He goes to the historical information, things that scholars already knew but just overlooked and didn't give them the weight that they deserved. So he goes to Irenaeus, ancient apostolic father, and he notices in Irenaeus's writing that he's quoting the four gospels and that he says the four gospels are like the four corners of the earth. And what he's saying is, look, this is just really good historical information that we're getting here, and we're just pushing it aside. And if we listen to this historical information, it's telling us the Gospels were not first century, but second century, not only second century, but written by the people that we believe they were written by. And then he goes on to Tertullian, who, who is combating Martian, who denied some of the Gospels because they were Jewish and anything Jewish. Irenaeus, uh, Marcion did not want in, in in his canon. So Tertullian is combating this and Tertullian is quite clearly making it clear that there are four Gospels. So again what Tischendorf is saying is this is just brilliant historical information to confirm that the four Gospels were written in the first century and were written by the people they were written by. And I think he's correct. And I think there has been a witch hunt by modern scholarship over the last 150 years against Irenaeus and Tertullian, not really wanting to give full weight to this kind of to these people. That's me. Back to Tischendorf. He says, I insist therefore to sum up the matter that the testimony of Irenaeus and Tertullian respecting the four Gospels is not to be taken as an isolated, unrelated fact. But it, it must be considered as a valid result of all the historical evidence which was at their command. And how far we are justified in this is shown not only by the authorities already adduced the author of the Maritori list of New Testament books, the African translators of the Gospels into Latin, and the originator of the Itala, but by all the other witnesses who lived prior to the time of Irenaeus and Tertullian. Many of my readers are acquainted with the so-called harmonies of the Gospels, the works in which the four sacred narratives are coordinated into single one. In this way, an effort has been made to draw the Gospels alone to as closely followed and faithful portrait of our Lord's life, those points which one narrator has brought more prominently into a view than the others being employed as supplementary the other accounts, and a complete picture being the result. In these works, the narrative of John has been drawn upon to supply the incidents occurring in the last three years of Jesus' life and to follow his course step by step. Harmonies of this kind were prepared as early as 170 AD by two men whose names are known to us. One of them was Theophilus, Bishop of Antioch in Syria, and the other was Tatian, a disciple of Justin, the great theologian and martyr. True, both of those works are lost, but Jerome speaks in the 4th century of the one prepared by Theophilus as still existing, describing it as a combination of the four Gospels in one continuous narrative. Respect to the second, we have the testimony of Eusebius and Eusebius and Theodoret. The later of him speaks within an, in, an, an intimate knowledge. Tatian himself alludes to his work as the gospel made up of four, the Diatasron. Both of these men wrote other works which are still in 180 and 181. Theophilus in edit, indicted the three books as uh, to Ochilicus, a learned heathen who had assailed Christianity. And this, uh, in this work are extracts from Matthew, Luke and John. It is especially noteworthy that he cites the later uh, to chapter 2.22, alluding explicitly to the name of the author. His words are, this is taught by the Holy Scriptures and all inspired men among whom is John, who says, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the word was God, all things were made by him and without him. This makes it certain that the harmony of the Theopolis embraced the Gospel of John. The same is true of Tatian, for in his address to the heathen, a work filled with learning and very decided in its tone, written probably between 160 and 170 AD, there are several passages quoted from John's Gospel, such as this, the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness apprehended it not. The light was the light of men, and all things were made by him. 
from this it would seem certain that his harmony, like that of Theophilus, although it may have taken some liberties with the order of the narrative, including the Gospel of John, and this chimes admirably with the statement of Bishop Bar Salavi that the Diatessaron annotation, accompanied by a commentary by Ephraim, and thus discriminated from the Diatessaron of Ammonius, began with the words, in the beginning was the word. These harmonies last mentioned, one of which must, with much probability, be inscribed to a date within the first 60 years of the second century. A far more worth than that would be gathered from a single scattered extracts for their preparation points back conclusively to time when the four Gospels were already accepted as a perfect record and when the necessity had begun to be felt of deducing a higher unity and a more harmonious completeness from them and the diversity of their looks and the apparent discrepancies had rendered apparent. If these efforts are to be assigned to a date as early as the second decade, excuse me, subsequently to the middle of the second century, it makes the inference a necessary one that the use of the recognition of the four Gospels must be assigned to a much earlier date. Totally agree. So basically he's saying there that there were these Gospel harmonies right from around about 160 AD, that's basically what he's saying. And these various gospel harmonies that were based on four gospels, which shows again that they were already authoritative, and that pushes the date of the gospels back into the first century and to the authorship of those gospels. So that's basically what he's arguing for there. He goes on similar testimony we owe to the contemporary of the two men just named Claudius uh, Apollinaris, Bishop of. Hierapolis and Phrygia, Phy whose epoch is assigned by Eusebius, uh, 426, to the reign of Marcus Aurelius. For in a fragment preserved in the Chronicon Pas Pasgel, he declares that if the Quadraciminians, so-called from holding like the Jews, that the 14th of Nisan was the day for celebrating the Pascal sacrifice, appealed justly to Matthew in support of the view that Jesus partook of the Last Supper with his disciples at the precise time of celebrating the Paschal offering. There must be an antagonism among, among the writers of the several Gospels. Now as in this context, Matthew, Mark and Luke must be ranged on the side and John on the other. The words of Apollinaris Ap Ap indicate that all the Gospels were conceded in his death to have equal value. <coughs> to this may be added that in one passage still extant in the same Chronicon there is undeniable reference to John's allusion in chapter 1934 to the piercing of Jesus' sign. According to Eusebius, the choice of Dionysius as Bishop of Corinth occurred in the year 170 AD. The same historian has preserved for us Eusebius 423 some fragments of letters and other documents from the pen of Dionysius. To one church he sent in the epistolary form exposition of scripture, and to the Romans he wrote after admitverti uh, animadver sorry, animadverting severely upon the efforts to discredit the genuineness of his own letters. That, was, that it was not all strange that men sought to discredit the gospel since these two were documents his value was so great that their identity should be indisputable. The expression Holy Scriptures might not necessarily refer to the New Testament, but the word which Dionysius employs writing respecting the law, the same term which Clement of Alexandria uses, Strom, page uh, 7, verse 1, has the same significant signification with the expression New Testament and relates evidently to the books which were then accepted as consti constituting the New Testament canon. The apology written by Athenag um, Athenagoras of Athens in the year 177 AD contains several quotations from Matthew and Luke. It displays also unmistakably marks of being influenced by John's Gospel. As for example, in the passage which speaks of the Logos as the Word of God and which alludes to the Son of God who is in the Father as the Father is in the Son. It contains the very expression found in the first chapter. John 
third verse, all things were made by him, and in the seventh chapter, 20th verse, as thou father art in me, and I in thee. I'll just make a point here. What I'm beginning to see here is a, as a massive scholar who is actually just absolutely got the scholarly period of the second century at his fingertips. I mean, we're going to to bishops who and writers in Athens uh, about the gospel. So we're in a we're in the hands here of a of a brilliant scholar, and uh, it's marvelous to see. Uh, and we do well to listen to what he's saying and realize that a lot of these things that he's saying. Uh, and actually have been confirmed even more as we've gathered more material. And what we need to do is start a renaissance in the academic world to going back to these ancient sources and reassess them with a more objective way of thinking rather than the biased enlightenment methodologies that came in uh, and have stopped us from actually looking at this source material in a, in a more objective way. We, we've been too engrossed in source criticism too engrossed in form criticism not to rely upon this kind of evidence which is fatal uh, if we're going to do proper historical reconstruction of how the New Testament came to be. So he says, I have taken these witnesses to the credibility of the four Gospels from the epoch prior to Irenaeus and Tertullian and just at the threshold of Irenaeus period, the second and third decades after the middle of the second century. There are, however, left to us other witnesses much earlier, and like those just quoted, men who speak to us right from the very bosom of the church. Between the apostolic epoch and that which followed there intervened the so-called apostolic fathers. For as direct disciples of the apostolic apostles, they must be reckoned as in immediate connection with the apostolic age, if in the little which these men have left us, we do not find anything which can be constructed as definite testimony as to the authenticity of their Gospels. Still, we are not to conclude from their silence that the Gospels were not in existence before their time. And should there be in their writings a constant use of the Old Testament and not the slightest use of the New, in spite of the fact that the later say much nearer to hand, the probability must be accepted as great that at that time the Gospels were not accepted as of equal weight with the Old Testament. And this appears to have been the case with the Epistle of Romans Clement, written in the second or third decade before the close of the first century, and about a decade after the destruction of Jerusalem. At that time, no canon of Gospel was in existence. It is indeed unquestionable that in his epistle, rich in quotation of the Old Testament, Clement refers here and there to passages in the Pauline epistles, which have indeed chronologically prior over the Gospels, though not in any other sense. It is otherwise with those other constituents of this literature to whose discussion we now come, the epistles of Ignatius and that of Polycar. The first of these have reached us in various in extant, variously edited. Three extant only in Latin are manifestly later additions to the older literature and so too are five others written in Greek, Latin and Armenian, their authenticity being disowned by the fact that Eusebius makes no allusion to them. There are besides seven epistles which are extant in longer and shorter form. Of the longer ones there is also an ancient Latin version of the shorter, a Latin version in the Syriac and Armenian one as well. With this to be joined the fact that 20 years ago Syriac version of the three of these seven epistles was discovered more brief than the short Greek text. After the debate respecting the longer and shorter epistles had been decidedly settled in favor of the shorter the question arose whether the three extant in the Syriac translations are not to be preferred to these even shorter ones. When several scholars declared themselves in favor of this others defended the earlier origin of the seven Greek epistles in insisting that the three in Syriac were a mere extract intended for devotional use. We hold this to be a more correct view. Similar occurrences are not unknown in the apocryphal writings of the New Testament. An extraordinary proof in this case is afforded by the circumstances that these seven epistles are not only recognized by Eusebius in 336, but are alluded to in the letter of Polycar. In order to escape the force of this testimony, the most decisive 
massive passage in the later epistle, defended as it is by Eusebius himself, must be set aside as unauthentic. Besides this, the assigning of the superior value of the three Syriac letters is invalidated by the fragmentary character of many passages. One is so manifestly an extract from the Greek text that it must be admitted that one section has been lost through carelessness of the copyist. Just a little nod here. A Bishop Lightfoot, a 19th century scholar, did a lot of work on um, these letters. So if you want to, and even now, the classic pieces of writing. So if you want to know more about Polycarp and these early letters of Clement and all the rest writings, you know, go and read uh, Bishop Lightfoot on Apostolic Fathers and uh, you'll get some helpful material there. We claim the right, says Tischendorf, therefore of holding to the authenticity of the of an epistle described by Eusebi Polycarp to Ignatius and written while he was the, on his way from Antioch through Samaria, Smyrina and Troyes to his martyrdom at Rome. Examining them with reference to our present theme, we find several allusions to Matthew and John. Take this passage, letter to the Romans, chapter 6. For what is man profitive if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Taken literally from Matthew 16. In like manner, the passage in his epistle to the people of Smyrna, Smyrna in which he asserts of Jesus that he was baptized by John in order that all righteousness might be fulfilled by him, reminds one of Matthew 3.15. For thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. In the letter to the Romans, chapter 7, he writes, I want the bread of God, the bread of heaven, and the bread of life, which is the body of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And I want the draught of God, the blood of Jesus, which is imperishable love and eternal life. Compare this with the chapter of John. I am the bread which came down from heaven. I am the bread of life, verse 51, and the bread that I will give in my flesh, verse 54. Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood, I have eternal life. To the Philadelphians he writes in chapter 7, What if some wish to lead me astray after the flesh, but the spirit is not enticed, he is from God. He knows wherever he cometh and whether he goeth, and he bringeth to punishment that which is hidden. These verses have as their basis John 3, 6 to 8. While he last clause grows out of the 20th verse, where these allusions of Ignatius to Matthew and John are mere isolated phenomenon, and one which would be adverse to other points in this discussion, and which no doubts rest, they would have not have decisive weight. But so far from militating against other points of evidence, they are in full agreement with them, particularly in the view of the fact that at the time when the letter were written between 107, the date generally assigned, and 115, they contain references to the two of the most important of the four Gospels. Very important evidence there. Um, just going to have a, a drink. See what uh, time we're on here. Be with you in one second. I'm just having a break for a minute. Uh, just feel free to just just have a break just for a minute. I I, I really enjoy this kind of stuff. I really love it, and uh, I just like reading this kind of material. And uh, I understand this stuff more than I do uh, cosmology. Uh, so we got. Uh, yeah. So I under I understand. I 
understand this more. Um, I understand it more um, than uh, cosmology. Uh, that's what I think, anyway. So what I'm doing now is I'm just just going to find out um, so we're 51 minutes in uh, to this uh, program and I'm going to just continue um, for a little bit while longer because uh, it, it's a very important topic and you've been given a lot of scholarship to reflect on there and to think about so let's continue Tischendorf says the letter of Polycarp to the Philippians connects itself most closely with those of Ignatius according to his own testimony it was written very soon after the martyrdom of Ignatius, that is between 107 and 115. It contains very brief quotations from Matthew, as for example in chapter 2, think on the Lord, how he said, judge not that you be not judged. Matthew 7, 1, forgive and it shall be forgiven you, similar to Matthew 6, 14. Be merciful that you may obtain mercy, compare Matthew 5 to 7. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. A literal quotation from Matthew 7, 2. And blessed are the poor, that they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs of the kingdom of heaven, taken almost verbatim from Matthew 5, 3 and 10, further, etc. So, he goes on, petitioned off to show quote, more quotes from these early church fathers. He goes, special weight must be ascribed to the passage in which Polycarp's letter, which clearly manifests the use of the first epistle of John, Polycarp writes, For everyone who does not confess that Jesus is Christ is come in the flesh is an antichrist. In John 4.3, the passage runs, Every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus is come into the flesh is not of God, and this is the spirit of antichrist. The importance of this use by Polycarp of the epistle of John is based upon this, that although the heroes of doubt bring into suspicion even that which is really indisputable, the epistle and the gospel of John are shown by their essential unity of incident and language to have necessarily had the same author. Thus the use of the epistle argues the use of the gospel as well. I have shown above from Polycar's intimate relationship to John how valuable in his testimony that has such great weight as scarcely to allow a word to be uttered in disavowal of the writings which he confirms. The unworthy skill of modern scholars has not shrunk, however, from setting aside the fact of Polycarp's testimony and un unnerving its strength. A writer of much acuteness says, We are not compelled to regard the words of Polycarp as an actual quotation from John, for that may have been a sentence which had come into circulation, in which the church may have been committed to paper by John, just as well as by Polycarp, without compelling piling compelling the later to learn it from the former. Before this conjecture had been uh, brutened, which I don't, I don't know what that means, a fellow believer had fallen upon another way out of the difficulty. Can the thing not be reversed? May not the author of the Johann Gospel, which is a little genuine, as so much else that has for 2,000 years received the reverent homage of Christendom, may not this false John I've cited as well from Polycarp, it requires a great deal of courage to give utterance to such an idle fancy, yet there are men of learning who are not lacking in this courage. But the universal and radical medicament which must be relied on at the last admits in this instance of double application. If the Gospel of John can be thrown overboard so easily, the epistle of Polycarp cannot so easily be disposed of. Polycarp then did not write the epistle. Yet the disciples of Polycarp, Irenaeus, believed and gave his witness to just the contrary. But there are never lacking spacious grounds for false position. The professors of the 19th century have the art of putting out of sight even in Irenaeus and his followers. The attack on the authenticity of Polycarp's epistle is 
is all the more worth refuting if successful it does away no less with the genuineness of Ignatius epistles all the more troublesome if they are to be accepted in the limits which Polycarp and Eusebius assign to them on this account the latest outbreaks of critical presumption and audacity have been directed against the whole Polycarp Ignatius literature what one of these critical heroes does not venture another does one goes to work more in root and branch and fashion and another more artistically the one contents himself with rejecting on his own authority all those passages in Polycarp's letter which allude to the person and epistle of Ignatius imputing them to a forger known to have lived long before Eusebius time the other on the contrary casts away the whole letter in like manner the one satisfies himself with regarding the three shortest Syrian epistles of Ignatius as genuine the other holds it more advisable to assert that not a single one of the collective letters of Ignatius is genuine such things as this would soon convert the temple of God into a common ruin for my own part I do not hesitate to advance further in the period of Polycarp just in a martyr even before his violent death in Rome in 160 made his memory clear to the church had attained to great celebrity through his writings three of his works are still still in existence in the complete form and their authenticity is undisputed the two apologies and the dialogue with the Jew Trifon Eusebius displays perfect familiarity with the two which were written to defend Christianity against the attacks of high pagan authorities and speaks of them as two separate works one of which was dedicated to the Emperor Antonymus the other to Marcus Aurelius Jerome repeats the statement of Eusebius and most scholars down to the present day have conceded with him coincided with him the first work must be assigned to the year one through three eight or one three nine the other one six one and the first year of the reign of Marcus Aurelius respecting the first however it should be said that it was one three nine that Marcus Aurelius Versimus was named as Caesar yet is the inscription does not address him with the imperial title very recently there have been very recently there have been new views taken respecting this matter and there has been unjustified evidence brought forward to support the signing of the year 147 to the production of the first of the two works in question some moreover have felt themselves justified in taking a position not a, not warranted by Eusebius and Jerome and in regarding the second apology as no independent production but a mere appendix to the first neither the one view or the other appears to me to be thoroughly grounded still the value of Justin's testimony is very little affected by the question whether he wrote a few years prior or subsequent to the year 148 yet the fact that these two works of Justin's were written prior to the middle of the second century made the question one of the great interests whether he discussed our Gospels in them it is topic which has been treated in our time by many persons and with great variance of opinion what is the essential result again from these investigations that Justin often quotes from our own Matthew is indisputable that in various passages follows Mark and Luke as extremely probable yet this fact has been invalidated by efforts of some to show that Justin did not use our Gospels as his basis but writings very like them in character perhaps the Gospel of the Hebrews or according to some of the Gospel of Peter which is derived from the letter but which with the exception of a few passages has remained entirely unknown to us to the present time one support of this view is found in the fact that some quotations of Justin are also found in the pseudo Clement homilies having the, the same or similar differences from the readings in a conical text the supposition however perhaps an admissible one that Justin at the very earliest times do that the Gospel of Hebrews which contains such repeated references to Matthew in the circle of his evangelical quotations in one of his first works for we have Eusebius authority in the first half of the fourth century for the fact that at the time this gospel was reckoned by several authorities as belonging to the canon on the other hand it is manifest and groundless exercise of arbitrary authority to hold that such of his quotations as harmonize more or less closely with our received text are taken from a source respecting which we are left to conjecture alone such a view is all the more inadmissible from the fact that free extracts from our Gospels are fully in accordance with the character of the times which they fall and this same epoch the first half of the second century to which we trace the main origin of the, the device, diverse materials which enter into the canon and a more, a more 
especially the Gospels. With equal freedom, Justin makes his quotations from the Old Testament, even if he may not be proved to take the text exclusive from the standard Septuagint. And the fact is not to be overlooked that the passage quoted by Justin from the Gospels cannot be judged by the documents comprising the New Testament text, which come, has come down to us and which forms the substance of our usual editions. It is clear that many of our most widely diffused readings have proceeded from earlier or more recent corruptions in the principal text. The Gospels especially were subject to arbitrary changes within the very first ten years after they had been committed to writing. My discussion thus far of the extracts which Justin makes, just a little thought, completely disagree with Tischendorf there. Um, that's just my thought. Um, just, just a little thought. I don't agree with him there. Um, and that comes down to his different school of textual criticism than mine. By the way, uh, I think he was, he made a mistake in his development of his textual criticism. I prefer the more Byzantine textual criticism of Dean Berger. Anyhow, my discussion, he says. Thus far of this extract which Justin makes from the Gospels relates solely to those which he draws from the synoptic ones. The first three, despite the prevailing scepticism in this matter, it is good as certain that Justin made use of these three Gospels, but all the more obstinate is the assertion that he had no acquaintance with the John's Gospel, but what in fact is his relation to John? In my opinion, there is more cognate reason for believing that John was read and used by Justin, the delineation of the person of Christ, characteristics of John, as for example in the opening of the Gospel in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and in the first 14 it became flesh as well as the general designation of Jesus as the Logos, a Word of God appears unmistakably in not a few passages in Justin, such as for instance as, and Jesus Christ was begotten in the manner wholly peculiar to himself, as the Son of God, while he also is the word Logos of the same. Primeval force, after the Father of all God and the Lord is the Son and the word Logos, and I shall show how he through the incarnation became man. The word Logos of God is the Son of the same. End of quote. As they have not confessed all that belonged to the Logos, which is Christ, they have often uttered what is at variance with itself. Another quote. End of quote. Another quote. Through the word Logos of God, Jesus Christ our Saviour became flesh. To these, end of quote, to these passages taken from the brief second apology, I had the following taken from the first, by the express quote, by the expression, the Holy Ghost of the Passover of God in Luke 135. So I think it's very, very clear from Justin Martyr that he quoted from the Gospels, and I think Tischendorf has made his point there. So I'm going to finish there. We're on page 74 there. So basically he's amassed a lot of evidence to show to show that the early church so We've finished now uh, here. What we've had, basically, if an atheist or a skeptic comes up to you and says, "The gospel. How do we know that the gospels were written by the gospel writers? How how do we know that th these should be in the canon? And why were the others not in the canon? And all the rest of it. We can say basically from what Tischendorf is saying: Irenaeus, Polycarp, Tertullian. The early church fathers and the apostolic fathers were quoting these four gospels as authoritative, and that proves that they are first century and that they come from these writers. That's the argument that he's making. And it's an unassailable argument, basically, absolutely unassailable. So well, there we are. Um, that's basically what this hour has come to. I hope that you've enjoyed this I absolutely love this kind of stuff I uh, really enjoy it and uh, enjoy reading this kind of material and uh, so I hope
but you find it a blessing. I'm, I'm, I make a cup of tea, have a rest for half an hour. I'm going to come back and I'm going to go on Christian Think Tank, pick an article there and read it and just talk about it for an hour. So, hope you're okay and God bless you all. Take care.